faithfulness, strength, courage, truth, last week generosity, and today we're talking about the legacy of goodness. And I have to tell you that, you know, I put these, um, I put this theme together last summer, and um, when I got it, got it out this week to kind of finish and finish the study and finish writing what I was going to talk about, I, I actually struggled more with this one than the previous seven weeks. And I think it's because the word is just so obvious, goodness. I mean, what can I say about goodness? Don't we kind of know what goodness is and what badness is? But then the more I dug into it, um, I realized that there's a lot to this word. In fact, there's, there's a lot of, of, of good thinking that needs to be done about this word. There's a lot of theology around this word. And it's really a chance to, uh, to get deeper than I first imagined. So the, the, the clip I'm going to show you, this is the second week in a row out of Gran Torino. And if you've seen the movie, you know Clint Eastwood's character uh, is this um, uh, uh, grizzled, uh, bitter, uh, alcoholic uh, Korean war veteran who's been widowed and he's angry at the whole world and um, shows it. But then he, uh, uh, out of chance, sort of befriends this uh, young Hmong refugee boy who had once tried to steal his car, the Gran Torino, uh, to be initiated into a gang, and they developed this friendship. Um, the clip I'm going to show you is after he's begun to befriend the boy, and he, uh, the, the boy's sister uh, ha- comes over to Walt's house to basically thank him for his growing friendship with her younger brother. And this is the clip I'm going to show you. It's kind of short, and we had to clean it up a little bit at one place, and you'll be able to see where that is. So... Uh, watch this little theme. Let me, I'll summarize the little theme. This, the, the boy's older sister comes over to, uh, to basically thank Walt for uh, befriending her brother because she sees some good things happening in her brother. Uh, and in the course of her conversation with him, um, he, in his way, sort of uh, insults her without meaning to. I forget what he calls her, but um, he's, he likes her too. But she eventually says, you're a good man, Walt. And he immediately says, I'm not a good man. So she says to him, she's trying to thank him. She says, you're a good man, Walt, because you've done some good things for my brother. And he says, I'm not a good man. Okay, that's where I wanted to take off today. Remember at the beginning of our uh, season, we showed a clip from from, uh, Saving Private Ryan right at the end of that movie when the old man, Private Ryan, is standing in a cemetery looking at the tombstone of the guy who saved his life. And he says to his wife, tell me I've been a good man. Remember, he says, tell me I've been a good man. He's desperate to know that he's been a good man. Here, Walt says, when he's being told he's a good man, he says, I'm not a good man. And I think that's profound, and we're going to come back to it in just a moment. Look at the text that's in your um, notebook here, Romans 7. This, I think, is one of the most amazing and often uh, misunderstood, passed over text in the New Testament. The Apostle Paul is writing, In the great letter to the Romans, he writes, For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man that I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. Now I love this text for several reasons. First, because it's just so honest. It's just so honest. This is the Apostle Paul, St. Paul, arguably one of the greatest minds in all of human history, arguably one of the most influential followers of Christ who ever lived. The man who wrote about half of our New Testament is the Apostle Paul, and he almost single-handedly brought the gospel to the Gentile world. We are here today as Gentiles, that is, non-Jewish followers of Christ, because 2,000 years ago, Paul risked his life to plant churches all throughout the known world. This is Paul, and he's struggling with goodness. He's telling you about the wrestling match in his heart Day after day after day. It's honest. Secondly, I love it because it describes and explains the world that exists inside of me. Remember I told you during the week we talked about truth, that I believe the Bible's true because it corresponds to what we see 
in, in the world. It corresponds to what I see in creation. It corresponds to what I see in the world. But it also corresponds to the world I see inside of me. What this text tells us is that goodness comes from God. Goodness, we believe, comes from God. I'm going to start in kind of a strange place, and I mentioned it in my little email to you this week. So bear with me. We're going to get back to goodness in God in just a moment. We live, I think, in what could be called a culture of outrage. Everybody is outraged about something. We live in a culture of outrage. Did you see that the, if you're a football fan, you might have seen the crazy uh, eight lateral play that the University of Miami used to beat uh, Duke, supposedly beat Duke a couple of weeks ago. Did you see that? Incredible play. It, it was on a kickoff. Uh, time ran out. Eight different laterals, and they scored a touchdown, win the game. Well, upon further review, they discovered that the officiating crew made at least four major errors including the, uh, the replay official who missed all four errors that in all four of those things could, should have caused the game to end with Duke as the winner. But they let it go, let it go, let it go, let it go, then approved it at the end. Miami wins, game over, Duke loses, and there's outrage. There's outrage. The fishing crew, officiating crew was suspended uh, from working in anymore for at least a game or two, uh, but they didn't give the game back to Duke. Outrage. We're outraged when the call goes against our team. People are outraged when Starbucks changes their Christmas cups. Did you been re have you been reading about that? Now, I think, Je Jeff and I did a little research on that. I think that whole outrage was, was invented. I think there was originally, it came from a satirical website in Great Britain. So I don't think there were actu actually ever Christians outraged about that. It was generated and caused this big, big thing. But people are outraged. It's ridiculous. Last week, uh, we as a church, and I didn't say this last week, I missed the opportunity, but last week on Thursday night, uh, FBCG hosted another huge women's event <laughs> right here in this room. It was called Girls' Night Out. 800 women came to Girls' Night Out, a very, a very well-known uh, uh, musical artist was speaking and singing. But one lady tried to sign up her father for the event on the website because he liked this woman's uh, music. Uh, when she was informed politely by our staff that this was a girls' night out, that it was for women only, the woman was outraged. She said, are you telling me my father is not welcome at your church? Well, no, he can come any other time. This is a girls' night out. I can't believe you call yourselves Christians. She was outraged. I'm not, I'm not making that up. She, that's really what happened. Why are we outraged? The culture of outrage is proof, I believe, not only of the existence of God, but that God is good. Now, uh, track me here. Listen to these verses from Psalms. They're not in your booklet, but listen. Psalm 136, 1. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Psalm 119, 68. You are good, and what you do is good. Teach me your decrees. The Bible says God is good. God is good, and everything God does is good, so it follows that goodness itself comes from God. In Genesis chapter 1, in the creation account, three different times God pauses in his work of creation to acknowledge the goodness of his creation. Day 3, and God saw that it was good. On day 6, early in the day, and God saw that it was good. At the end of day 6, and God saw all he had made, and it was very good. You could even say that God created goodness itself. God also created human beings, the Bible says, in his own image. So one aspect of that image of God stamped in us is knowing, recognizing, and longing for that which is good. We are made like God. So this helps explain why things like child abuse or incest have always been regarded as wrong or immoral in every human culture across the history of human civilization. Because we're stamped with the image of God, and God is good. That's why stealing that which doesn't belong to you is always regarded as wrong, every human civilization across the course of history. It's why love and bravery and self-sacrifice have always been regarded as good. Because God is good, and we are created in his image, even if we don't recognize God. We can't help behaving in this way because his image is stamped upon us. Without God, we would not know what goodness is, for God determines what is good. Uh, way back in the book of Exodus, God gave his people, the Israelites, the Ten Commandments. 
which was God's law. You shall not kill, you shall not steal, covet, bear false witness, commit adultery. He was establishing the boundaries of what is good. And those laws, by the way, have been basically the standard of almost every human civilization since he gave the Ten Commandments to Israel. In the New Testament, Jesus said, no one is good but God. Therefore, I think I can say uh, that all human experience of and desire for goodness is an argument for the existence of God. The very desire for goodness. So when we're outraged over a call that goes against the home team, when we're outraged about many more serious issues like what's happening at the University of Missouri and many other universities across America, when we are outraged, we're outraged because things are not as they should be. Something is wrong. Something is not good. And we long for things to be good. And that desire itself points to God himself. The Bible teaches that God created all things good. But then sin entered the world, we'll talk about that in a moment, and brought a curse on all creation. And that as human beings, we are also fallen creatures. The Bible is the story of God restoring us and all of creation to its original goodness, which ultimately, at the end of the story, will be a new heaven, a new earth, what we usually refer to simply as heaven. So part, part one today is goodness comes from God. Secondly, goodness begins in the heart. It begins in the heart. In Gran Torino, Walt says, I'm not a good man. I wish you could have heard the way he said it and how quickly he said it. I'm not a good man. That's a profound thing for him to say, for this character to say, and here's why. That character knows he is capable of doing some good things. He knows he's done some good things for this boy he's kind of befriended. He knows he was a decorated soldier in Korea. He knows he's capable of courage and great sacrifice. But he also knows he's not a good man. And that's profound because he recognizes, and I don't know, uh, Clint Eastwood uh, produced that film and wrote it. I don't know what he believes about all this stuff, but there's so many evidences in here that he understands what I'm talking about today. It's profound because this character recognizing that, recognizes that doing a few good things and being a good man are two completely different things. Do you hear that? Doing a few good things and being a good man are completely different things. It's both a profound truth and it's profoundly honest. And it's the same thing the Apostle Paul wrote 2,000 years ago. Let me read these words again. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me. That is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not, for I do, not do the good I want to do. But the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is the sin living in me that does it. Now Paul uses the phrase sinful nature and the phrase sin living in me. What does he mean by that? Well, the Bible teaches that beginning with the Garden of Eden, way back in the book of Genesis, when the serpent, who was uh, Satan personified, uh, lied and convinced Eve and then Adam to distrust God's command, to distrust God's nature, to distrust God's goodness, and to disobey God, since then humanity has fallen into sin and destroyed the original goodness of creation. Since that original sin, every human being is born into and with a sinful nature, with what the Bible teaches. That is, our hearts are naturally bent toward selfishness and sin. Think about it this way. If you're a parent, you, already, you know this. With children, we don't have to teach our children how to be selfish. Mine, they say, is one of the first things I learned how to say. Mine. I didn't have to teach my boys how to be selfish. We have to teach them how to share, Right? We don't have to teach them to lie or distort the truth. They sort of figure that out naturally. We have to teach them the value of truth. Or think about it this way. If this were not true, if every human being were not born with a sinful nature, we would not need law at all. Would we? We wouldn't need law. We wouldn't need police departments. We wouldn't need any of that. If we were, but, we, but we aren't. The world's a broken place. We know that. Instinctively, we know that. The center of our being is the heart. Not heart as the physical organ, but the heart is the center of our spiritual, emotional life. In Proverbs 4 in the Old Testament, we read, Keep your heart with vigilance, for out of it flow all the issues of life. 
The heart is the source, biblically speaking, of both good and evil. Uh, the heart is where God himself wants to dwell. We covered the gospel last week. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It's the heart with the heart that we believe and we are saved. It's how we establish relationship with God because that's where God wants to dwell in our hearts. In Ephesians 3, Paul writes, I pray that Christ will dwell in your hearts through faith. And when Christ enters our hearts through faith, he goes to work, and that work is transformational. He begins to transform us. Maybe a good way to think about it is he initiates a remodeling project in our hearts. Remodeling, you know, that is tearing out the old, tearing out the rotten, tearing out the broken, and installing new stuff. And here's the new stuff, and this text is in your booklet, Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit... That is, the Spirit of Christ who comes to dwell in our hearts by faith when we confess Jesus as Lord. Here's the new stuff that he begins to build. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, legacy of love, joy, we're going to get to that later, peace, forbearance or patience, kindness, and there's that word, goodness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such things there is no law. In other words, if these things are all growing in our lives, and God wants to grow them in each one of our lives, you don't need any law because you're following the law of goodness that God is establishing and growing in your heart through his spirit.